So my job is to look after and interpret the fantastic collections <coughs> at Chartwell. And what I thought I'd do very quickly first is introduce Chartwell, just in case any of you haven't had the chance to go, although you definitely should, it's definitely one for the bucket list. So Churchill moved into Chartwell in the early 1920s and it was his home for the rest of his life. So it's not one of those houses where they live there for a couple of years, it really was his home and there's this wonderful phrase that we use in quite a lot of our marketing, funnily enough, of a day away from Chartwell is a day wasted. So a wonderful little sound bite there from Churchill on how much Chartwell meant to him. Chartwell is the only place in the world where you can see Churchill's possessions in their original domestic setting, which is absolutely remarkable. After Churchill died in 1965, there was a year of preparing it for opening to the public, which was the National Trust working very closely with the Churchill family, turning back the clock to broadly a pre-war layout and representation of their life. So that in itself is really remarkable. It's not come to the National Trust after a period of decline. You've not had historians coming in saying they might have had one of these tables and if they had, they might have had it here because people tended to put it here. It's literally the people who spent their lives there putting their furniture and their belongings and their photographs of family and friends in the places that they were. So you will never find a more authentic representation anywhere else in the world of Winston Churchill. And I think but for today, one of the key things I would like you all to think about is, in terms of Churchill's belongings, how material culture can be a really interesting alternative source material. So I think historically, for studying history and studying Churchill, it's very easy to go to caricatures, to letters, correspondences, that sort of thing. And those are, of course, vital resources to understanding him. But there's also a very strong case for using his belongings to tell those stories as well. So the objects I'm going to talk to you about today comprise about a thousand of our 9,000 strong collection at Chartwell. They are a group of objects known as the Heirlooms Collection that were grouped together in Churchill's will. Uh, the clause relating to that section of the will references all my medallions, trophies, inscribed books or manuscripts which have been presented to me and other personal souvenirs and trophies. So these thousand or so items have been on long-term loan to Chartwell and there was risk that they might potentially con not continue to do so. Uh, it's one of the things where if you have a large collection on loan, it is, it is a risk to how you tell the stories. So we were delighted when the opportunity arose for us to acquire these items and that acquisition forms part of the Churchill's Chartwell project. So the grouping of these items in his will, I should say, is testament to his national and international achievements. They are referencing the group of items that he foresaw as representing his foremost and most important achievements. So really, it's an absolutely astonishing collection. This is Winston Churchill reflecting on his life, and these are the things that he thinks best represent his most important achievements. So what does this collection consist of? It consists of 101 objects and 898 inscribed book titles. And because some of those are multi-volume, that comprises 922 books in total. Now, following our fundraising appeal, which we launched in 2016, we have been able to buy all but one of these items. So we're nearly there, it's the home straight. Not quite yet, though. So what I'm going to do for you now is to talk about my top 10. It's not the ultimate top 10. I think every single historian looking at this group of objects would find something different to talk about. <coughs> but for me, these are the ones that I think are really interesting in terms of telling the stories of Churchill's life. So for those of you who did the object handling earlier, you might recognize this medal. This is the Arkan Charlemagne Prize Medal, which was presented 16 years to the day after Churchill became Prime Minister. So incredibly ceremonial that that was the day that was chosen. It was an award that was given to him in Germany and it was his first visit to Germany since 1945. The award itself is given 
uh, to individuals who are said to have contributed to Western European understanding of world peace and to promote European unity. I hope you are immediately seeing the connections in terms of relevance, in terms of using it to relate to current political affairs. Interestingly, Churchill is one of those figures who has been claimed by both sides of the Brexit debate. There are a number of whom, if you are a Remainer, you might say, well, one of his most important post-war speeches is entitled Europe Unite! Exclamation mark. Seems to be in the title somewhat that he wanted Europe to be as one. However, if you're a Brexiteer, you're going to say, well, actually, did he foresee Britain being part of that Europe? Yes, he wanted the continent of Europe to be united for there to be no more wars. But did he see our great island nation being within that? So it's been an interesting couple of years at Charwell since the Brexit vote. And a lot of people comment on this object. And the fact that it's part of our handling collection as well is really fantastic because it means it can be taken out into schools and it can prompt that conversation to itself. I should say as well, when Churchill went to receive the award in 1956, he was naturally somewhat nervous, you know, going back to Germany, first time since 1945. And he was said to have been astonished at the extent of the cheering that was happening when he received his medal. I was speaking to a number of German visitors to Chartwell quite recently and it was really interesting chatting to them because they said, well, we're here because he saved us too. So equally, you can look into that really interesting narrative around reactions to him after the war as well. So object number two, the 80th birthday book. I don't know if any of you have seen The Crown very well produced series. Interesting depictions of Churchill, I think it's safe to say. And one of the more memorable scenes includes a painting being given for his birthday, for his 80th birthday, which is, a, in my personal opinion, a very unflattering depiction of him. So it's the one in the bottom at the middle. And given that it's for his 80th birthday, I think it would be safe to say he probably imagined a nice depiction, a flattering one. Um, there are people who say it, it was completely wrong that this painting be destroyed, but I think that given that it was meant to be in honour of him, in celebration of him, you can understand why he was quite hurt in what is quite a probably honest but arguably cruel depiction of him. What's less well known is that this was one half of a two-part gift. The other half survives and is at Chartwell, and it is the 80th birthday book. You can see the book on the left and at the top, and it is signed but all but a handful of members of Parliament. It is an honour that has not been since or never before been bespoken on any individual parliamentarian. Churchill's quote in reaction I love, which is, there has never been anything like it in British history. And indeed, I doubt whether any of the modern democracies abroad have shown such a degree of kindness and generosity to a party politician, and this is my favourite bit, who has not yet retired and may at any time be involved in controversy. He's not done yet, and he's making it very clear he's not done yet. He retires from the role of Prime Minister the following year, but continues to sit in the House of Commons for another decade, which is remarkable to think of compared to, say, our politicians today, that you'd have someone nearing 90 representing a constituency. So for me, this book is really interesting to tell that story of the last few years of his life as a parliamentarian, and then you can connect it to his post-war achievements and honours as well. Item number three, the freedom of Kensington. I love the fact that when he receives it, he just starts waving it around. <laughs> this is his reaction. He's so excited, and Clementine's there looking on very proudly. So why does he get the freedom of Kensington? It is a constituency in which he lives. He has a second house in Kensington towards the end of his life. The freedom of Kensington, interestingly, is a replica of a baton used by his ancestor, the first Duke of Marlborough. And the amount of thought that's been put into this, this award is that it has been made from walnut, from a tree that will have witnessed the Battle of Blenheim. So the tree dates from before the battle and therefore it will have seen it. And for Churchill as a historian, 
the huge admiration he held for his ancestor, this will have meant so, so much to him. He's also only the second person to be given the freedom of Kensington. The first is Princess Louise, Duchess of Argyle, who was the fourth daughter of Queen Victoria. Um, don't ask me why she got it or why no one else did before Churchill. I think Churchill is by far the most famous recipient of this though. And I think this object can then be used to tell the narrative around him as a writer, him as a historian, his awareness of his place in history. Next object is two hairbrushes made from wood from HMS Exeter. So what I should say as well, or I should reiterate, of course, is that these items, every single one of them, from all of Churchill's possessions, he has decided to put in this grouping in his will of the things that meant most to him. So why would a couple of hairbrushes make it in to that hugely important part of his will? So the wood from the hairbrushes is made from the deck of HMS Exeter. HMS Exeter fought in the Battle of the River Plate in 1939. So a really interesting time in the Second World War. We're still in the midst of the Phony War. Churchill is First Lord of the Admiralty. He's not yet Prime Minister. And the ship came back with... There were a number of casualties and the ship was very badly damaged, but actually it was positioned as not quite a victory, but there were elements of celebration made afterwards. And the quote given by Churchill when writing to Neville Chamberlain about the battle said she was hit over a hundred times, one turret smashed, three guns knocked out, and 60 officers and men killed and 20 wounded. Indeed, the Exeter fought one of the finest and most resolute actions against superior range and metal on record. I think it's safe to say quite a bit of spin there on Churchill's part. He's taking what was actually quite a serious military endeavour and positioning it as a supreme act of bravery, which of course it was. So when the ship came back, it was decided that three pairs of hairbrushes would be made out of the deck. Churchill gets one, the captain of the ship, Captain Bell, gets a pair, and King George VI gets the third pair. What's interestingly lacking in that list is a pair of hairbrushes for Chamberlain. Very interesting that at a time when Churchill's on the ascendancy, and you could argue that Chamberlain is falling seriously out of favour quite rapidly by spring 1940, that it's not even diplomatic anymore to make him a gift, which would have been very symbolic, very public. So for me, this represents that really interesting time where he's on the brink of the, of the office of Prime Minister, this office that he's felt was coming all his life. From childhood, there's quotes of Churchill's that he's going to be Prime Minister one day. And so this is the, the last moments before he finally gets that honour. When Churchill received the hairbrushes, he said, I am pleased to accept the souvenir of such an historic occasion, and I much appreciate the kindly thought which prompted you to send the gift to me. Again, thank you Believe me, yours truly, Winston S. Churchill. The other side of the coin of this is we know that Churchill used the hairbrushes as well. So they pose an interesting everyday domesticity as well as international importance. So as with all objects from the past, there are some elements of conjecture this one in particular um, has a number of theories abounding as to who it's from. On the inside of this wallet, it says, from George. For a while, the thinking was that it was George V, who was king at the time it was gifted. Um, sorry, not king, he would have been prince at that point. And um, it was, it just sort of doesn't make sense. Their relationship wasn't quite right at that point for that to likely have been a gift. The more likely contender for it is a gentleman called George Cornwallis West. So George Cornwallis West was soon to be Churchill's uh, stepfather. So Jenny Jerome, fabulous, glamorous American heiress. Her husband, Lord Randolph Churchill, had died some years earlier and she is marrying a gentleman who is only a couple of weeks difference in age to Winston. So you can imagine there is um, 
I'm trying to think of a good way of putting it, uh, an amount of sort of favour one wants to gain from one's very influential, soon to be, stepson. Churchill isn't overly happy about the match. And I put this quote on saying, Mama was married to George West on Saturday and everything went off well. George looked supremely happy in having at length obtained his heart's desire. As we already know each other's views on the subject, I need not pursue it. And that's Churchill writing to his younger brother, Jack. So when George Cornwallis West is trying to gain favour with Winston, he writes to him, My dear Winston, I cannot impress upon you how much I appreciate the line you have taken as regards my marriage to your mother. I have always liked and admired you, but I do so ten times now. I only wish, as I wrote and told my father, that my family could have taken a leaf out of your book. Nothing could have exceeded the sympathy and kindness which you and all the Churchills have shown me. So what are you going to do if you are about to marry a woman who you love and you're having a difficult situation with your stepchildren to be? You might very well try and find common ground with them. And that's exactly what George Cornwallis West would have been doing in this. Winston having been a former cavalry officer by the time of the wedding, and George Cornwallis West is the gentleman in the picture on the top left. So they're trying to find common ground. Um, the pair never become firm friends, I think it's fair to say. But Ch Churchill does see how happy Cornwallis West makes his mother. What is interesting is that this wallet has become part of this group of items. Why is it in this list of items? And I think there's something really interesting to be explored about whether there are layers to that relationship that haven't yet been unveiled, maybe going back into the archives a bit more. So I think, as with all the objects, there's always more research to be done, as is the case with all of history, of course. But I think that the fact that this is in that list makes it a really interesting item. So another family one here, and I think all of the family items that are in this grouping are remarkable unto themselves. This is a walking stick, something of course which Churchill is very famous for. He ends up using it heavily in his imagery uh, later in his political career. That, the V for victory, the cigar, they're all part of what you know Winston Churchill for. So the walking stick is a gift from William Hosier, who is Clementine, his wife's younger brother. But there's a real sadness to this stick, and I'll tell you why. So we know that it's after 1920, as there is reference on the stick to the Carlton Club, and Churchill only started living there from February 1920. And we know it's before September 1920, because that's when um, Bill stopped staying there. Um, what we know even more so in terms of pinpointing a date is that in April 1921, the following year, William Hosier took his own life. Clementine it was one of four children, and I put two pictures on the left here showing her and her three siblings. Uh, in both cases, Clementine is the one on the right. Now, Clementine had lost her elder sister Kitty when she was only a teenager, and to lose Bill as well was a uh, extremely difficult situation for Clementine to find herself in. The relationship between Clementine's brother and Winston was a warm friendship, but it got tainted because Winston kept having to bail his brother-in-law out of gambling debts. So there's a letter from February, just two months before Bill takes his own life, saying, Dear Winston, in accordance with my promise to you, I now give you my word of honour not to engage in any form of gambling, at cards, racing or game of chance. Yours affectionately, William Hosier. Now, from the very sad quote on the right, two months later, this is Clementine writing to Winston, saying, Oh, Winston, my dear, do come tomorrow and dignify by your presence Bill's poor suicide's funeral. Race cards were found on him with very small bets registered on them, 200 francs or so. So he had found himself going against his promise to Winston. Winston had bailed him out one last time. And unfortunately, in the subsequent weeks, it looks like it just spiralled out of control. So the fact, again, that this is in that grouping of items 
shows it to have been something very, very important to Sir Winston Churchill and that relationship between Winston and his in-laws, for example, can be explored through an object like that. So one thing I hope that is coming through is how objects are never just objects. They're people, their stories, their lives, their happiness, their sadness, their pride, their so many things intertwined. And whether you're talking about Churchill, the writer, the military figure, the artist, the family man, Chartwell is absolutely full of these incredible, unique, internationally important items to tell his story. I'm going to move away from the family man now and go a bit more to the, the Churchill that is so commonly known, um, Churchill the war leader. So the Malta trophy is a really interesting one. Malta was incredibly heavily bombed during the Second World War, um, far more so than, than London in fact. And a trophy was sent to Winston Churchill after the Second World War in homage to the role he played in securing freedom and liberty for Malta. In reply to the gifting of it, um, this is an item from the archive here, so I'll do a little plug for the archive as well. Uh, I'm sending you here with a photograph which I have signed and some cigars as a small measure of recognition of your kindness in presenting me with this beautiful Maltese shield. This, which now hangs in my study here, is a continual source of pleasure to me and the care and craftsmanship which produced it have my warm admiration. It will be a perpetual reminder of Malta's gallantry during the war. So one thing we can explore with this item as well is there's a, a wonderful element in that the place it got hung the day it arrived at Chartwell is the place it still hangs today. We know that as soon as it arrived at Chartwell, into the study it went. And the study is really where Churchill surrounds himself with items that you know, give him a real warm, warm sense of pride and achievement. And so, as with so much of Chartwell, it is as it was when he left it. Slightly different item now, and we're sort of in the home straight, a few more to go. But this is a watercolour of Churchill's orders um, by uh, an artist, Dorothy Hutton. And what I love about it as well is it's this wonderful grouping of all his uh, honours in one piece, but actually it's updated, it's a bit like a CV. As new honours come in, they sort of get shoehorned in at the last minute. I think the American citizenship is the last one to have been added to there. When Sir Nicholas Soames visited Chartwell uh, about a year ago, he told me that this was one of the things he remembered most when visiting his grandfather at Chartwell. So he was really touched to see that it was still pride of place and uh, rightfully so will now, following our fundraising campaign, remain at Chartwell. It was presented in 1959 and it was commissioned by two friends of Churchill's. In reply, Churchill writes, My dear Rock, thank you and Sybil so much for sending me the beautifully executed gift. I'm happy to have this most useful and pleasing work. I love the fact he puts useful, like he might forget. It's handy to have them all in one place. Uh, would you convey my compliments to Miss Hutton for the way in which she has carried out your idea? Um, and then he compliments Rock on his handwriting. One thing that's quite interesting as well is that with Churchill's possessions, we know when there were inquiries to borrow items during his lifetime. And there was an ask that this be featured in a calligraphy exhibition um, in the last few years of Churchill's life. But the decision was made, um, and the note from Anthony Montague Brown, Churchill's private secretary, reads, I have discussed this with Sir Winston and Lady Churchill, and they do feel that a year is rather a long time for this adornment to the house to be absent. So they didn't want it to go anywhere. They wanted it on the wall. He absolutely loved it being there. It meant a great, great deal to him. And today you can see it if you are going from the uniform room to the study. So it's one of the last things you see before you go into the space that really was where he ran his world from at Chartwell. So last couple. So this is an post-war gift. This is the MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, mid-century convocation. 
So his response to this gift, or this award I should say, is I have to thank you for your two gifts and two presentations which I value very greatly. The first is that I am an honorary lecturer of MIT, which means I can come and lecture you on any matter which may excite my interest. The second is the presentation to me from the student body of these items. May it always be the means of giving me the feeling and faith that I have the key to American hearts. Always a wordsmith, wasn't he? He knew exactly who he was talking to, how to handle his audience and how to really create that feeling of warmth. So what I love about this is it's an element relating to science and technology. Uh, Churchill, of course, was a real campaigner in the development of science and technology. That is, of course, why Churchill College exists today. Uh, a number of really key technological developments earlier in his career can be connected. For example, the development of the tank, which made such a difference in terms of the outcome of the First World War. The speech that he made was televised and it was seen by millions of people in the United States. It was one of the most watched programs of that year. Uh, so it was an occasion with an unusual twist as well, however. So towards the end of the speech, Churchill takes a sip of water from his glass and in doing so delays the whole ending of the speech by one minute. But knowing that the audiences were so desperate to hear him speak, the broadcasters decided to cancel the following programme rather than cut Churchill off. In order to compensate the advertiser that should have followed, they had to pay out $15,000, equivalent to about £150,000 today. So arguably the most expensive sip of water Churchill ever made. I think there's something really interesting there as well as the technological element of his popularity in the United States. Of course, his mother had been American and so you can look at that angle as well. And there's just so many different component ways you can look at these post-war honours and awards and all of which can tell stories about his life. So we're on to the last one for those of you who have been keeping count. So I said that we had over a thousand objects. One that we haven't bought yet. So hopefully you'll be delighted to hear that all those you've seen so far have now been acquired. So all of these objects which could possibly have left the walls of Chartwell are now going to remain there forevermore for future generations to come and learn all about Churchill's life, his achievements, his legacy. As part of the project as well, of course, we want to weave in relevance for future generations. And that's a big part of what I'm doing with the project, is to tell these stories, but to connect them to today. So things like the Ark and Charlemagne Prize, linking it to Brexit, with all of the items that we've bought. So that's going to keep me very busy with a thousand of them. We want to make it so that Churchill is relevant and at the forefront of thinking for the next century. So the item that is left any thoughts on what it might be? It's a biggie. So Beatrice mentioned earlier that we were, have a £7 million project and we haven't quite got enough to buy the Nobel Prize in Literature. As of the date of this recording, uh, correct me if I'm wrong Beatrice, I think about £800,000 to go. So um, that is what is going to take us that final furlong to get this permanently on display at Chartwell. When it was awarded to Churchill, it was done so in 1953. The Nobel Committee had reportedly considered giving it to him earlier, but wanted him to finish his writing of Second World War histories that wasn't published until the 50s. Although, of course, he is a writer and historian, the award is given in large part owing to his oratory his ability to compose speeches and the power of his words, which interestingly have made him the second most quoted individual in the English language after William Shakespeare. When it was given to Churchill, the report in the Times said that Swinston Churchill in the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street yesterday was offered and formally accepted this year's Nobel Prize in Literature. Winston Churchill said, it is a literary distinction, and I am particularly proud of that. For so many people, Churchill is 
a political figure. He is, as I said earlier, the wartime leader, the V for victory. But actually, his bread and butter largely came from his journalism, from writing of histories. So it's a huge achievement for him that this is being recognised in this hugely prestigious award. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to attend the giving of the Nobel Prize in Literature. He had suffered from a stroke earlier in the year and in turn Clementine went to receive it on his behalf. So that is the award ceremony on the top left where his beautiful wife Clementine is receiving it. So in my opinion, there are two reasons at the forefront of why this object really, really should not leave Chartwell. Firstly, it is in the building in which he did so much of his writing. So many of those speeches desperately trying to raise awareness of German rearmament in the lead up to 1939. Uh, so many of his histories and, and writings were two rooms away from where this item is currently displayed. But not just that, if you look very, very carefully at the picture at the bottom, um, I'll have to show a bigger picture later possibly, if you can't quite see it, but on the right hand panel, look to the left of it, that is Chartwell in the illustration. So this Nobel Prize comes with a presentation folio including images of the things that inspired Winston Churchill most. On it are the Houses of Parliament, the Muse of Painting, the Muse of Writing, his ancestor, the first Duke of Marlborough, who of course we met earlier through the Freedom of Kensington, and right there, front and centre, is Chartwell. Because the Nobel Committee knew in commissioning this piece of art how much Chartwell was absolutely integral to his output as a writer and as an orator. Ah, there you go. I have included it in a larger one. Excellent. So this is the nursery wing at Chartwell. So if you look at Chartwell from the south, this is what you see. And the fact that it's there, front and centre, really shows the huge influence Chartwell had on him. So I should say as well a big thank you, uh, to, first of all, to all of you for, for, for listening. But also I always want to thank as well uh, the public who have, through their donations, allowed us to acquire, apart from that last one, all of these incredible items. And they are so important that they remain on public display so that people can see them, people can interact with them, people can see them in their original context. This isn't in museums that are completely distant, this is their original setting and very much where they belong. But as well as that, the fact that we have the handling collection as well means that the stories can go beyond the walls of Chartwell. So there's so many elements of the project that are going to bring Churchill to wider audiences and make him even more relevant for future generations. Thank you.